There must be lights burning brighter somewhere. Got to be birds flying higher in the sky. Hi, everybody. My name is Alan Light. I am a music journalist and author and a host on Sirius XM Satellite Radio, joined here by uh, a bunch of the team who worked on Baz Luhrmann's remarkable film, Elvis. Director, producer, co-writer, Baz Luhrmann. Oh. Actor, Austin Butler. Cinematographer, Mandy Walker. Production designer, Karen Murphy. Re-recording mixer, Michael Keller. And editor, Jonathan Redmond. We're going to be seeing the inspiration, the creation, and the performance of If I Can Dream, the climactic moment of the 1968 comeback special. Elvis came back from the army in 1960 and pretty immediately agreed to a contract set up by manager Colonel Tom Parker that locked him into multiple movies with multiple soundtracks every year. And that was pretty much the extent of his work through most of the 1960s. By 1968, his sales were down, his relevance was tumbling. In addition, 1968, of course, was a time of tremendous turmoil in the United States mm, with yeah. the assassinations of Dr. Martin Luther King, of yeah. Robert F. Kennedy, the Democratic Convention, chaos in the culture. There was a feeling that the world, probably like in the same way as in 9-11, that the world as we knew it was just being ripped apart. And I mean, if MLK could be shot, by the way, 30 minutes from Elvis's home in Memphis, right? You know, and RFK could be shot. You know, what kind of world are we in? It would be just as wrong and just as self-deceptive to conclude from this act of violence that our country itself is sick, that it's lost its balance, that it's lost its sense of direction, even its common decency. Finding that speech from President Johnson was a real key, and it, it just unlocked so much emotion in the scene, and working with that stock footage was uh, really fantastic. It, it really kind of anchored the scene emotionally and just felt really, really powerful. My fellow citizens, we cannot, we just must not tolerate the sway of violent men among us. We must not permit men that are filled with hate. Suddenly, Elvis is irrelevant. Elvis is over. And the colonel's actually got to a point whereby they're making a river of money. And then says, now boys, here's the script. Here's all of the Christmas songs Elvis is gonna sing. Here they're all ready. Here's the radio. You just do that and you're gonna have a great time. says, look, I really need help to get back to who I am. And they, and they said, well, what about the Colonel? What does he think? This is factual dialogue. And he said, he says, I don't give a damn what the Colonel thinks. And from that moment on, he says, just one thing, could we do gospel? Because you see, gospel was Elvis a safe place. We're pretty set for the number tomorrow, right? You think? It's pretty familiar territory, right? Reverend once told me, when things are too dangerous to say, sing. Elvis is really struggling. And that night, you know, one of the things about Elvis was, and Austin can tell you this in a much better way, because nobody knows more about Elvis Presley than Austin Butler. I have to tell you that. But what we tell the story did happen. Elvis did stay up all night. They did write that song. And Elvis turned the lights out and he recorded that song over and over and over and over again in embryonic position on the floor. There must be light burning brighter somewhere. Got to be birds flying higher in a sky more blue. So Austin, for you what to approach this moment, which is this again, this pivot point in this entire story. I mean, this moment of him deciding to take this risk, deciding to stand up to the Colonel. How did you approach all of the different emotions, all of the different things that are going on for him as we walk into this scene? I always knew that this moment was, was pivotal in, 
you know, you know it, it was this, it was this seismic shift in the rest of Elvis's career. I had had two years of preparation leading up to this this moment when we're finally going to shoot '68, which is not not only one of the the most important moments in Elvis's career, but it's one of the most iconic moments in rock and roll history. And uh, and so I'd done all the homework and 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 watched the footage, you know, every hour that I could. Um, but then the moment of truth comes when you got to shoot it, and and you realize that all this work that's that everybody has put in needs to be caught within this frame and it's between action and cut that that is the moment of truth and uh so i felt a lot of responsibility and pressure and and fear that goes along with that and and this feeling of if it didn't go well that i'd probably never work again you know that a lot of people have trusted me a lot of people have supported me and uh and believed in me and but if I go out there and I fail then it, it will all be for nothing and uh, and that feeling of my career could be over I, I thought that's exactly what Elvis is feeling so this isn't this isn't a bad thing that I'm feeling this I can actually this is actually a good thing and you, you, we were seeing all all that was happening in the world around that time and uh, and it, it just made me think of that time in the late 60s and all that's happening in the world at that time and the chaos and the confusion and singing the words of If I Can Dream felt just as poignant in, when we shot it as, it as I imagine it did back then. So that was my own personal experience that then I was able to really have an out-of-body experience because, you know, I, I'd spent the countless hours being meticulous about what his fingers were doing or what his eyes were doing in a certain moment. At that point, it was in my bones, and I could I could release that in a way, and just focus on the spirit of the music, and and uh, that was that was my experience. Standing by, we're seconds away, folks. Seconds away, we're just waiting on upstairs. We're gonna get a rehearsal going very shortly. Let's go, let's go, people. First positions. Here we go from the top. The colonel has said, "I've got the found the, I found the telex actually in Graceland in a box that said, if you don't." do a Christmas song, we'll be sued and I'll leave you. Like he, he, he really does that. Because the Colonel has said, Elvis Presley does not do message songs. Quite a homemaker Priscilla is, and I'm sure she would love to have one of the SK551 machines so she can hit Elvis's They're in there all night. Doing what? Yeah. He's working on a new song. He says he's singing it. New song? Well, oh, hey, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Yes. Gentlemen, take one, a seat. Two, three, four. Now that's a winter wonderland. Mr. Binder, you and I are on the same page at last. Bring up the lights on the sign. Okay, yeah, let's go. And Mandy, obviously it's a Baz Luhrmann movie. There's a lot of things visually going on, but talk about from your end, particularly as we go into this moment. Well, uh, this because this um, performance exists online, we were going to replicate this concert exactly as it was. And it, you can and Austin's performance was exactly the same as Elvis. And so for, between myself and and in Karen will tell you the art department, we got together to um, replicate the the environment and the set. and then we scoured, Australia for period um, light fixtures for the TV studio and um, and for and the cameras that were in the TV studio as well. We put one of our film cameras into the housing of the TV camera, so it'd be in exactly the right position <clears throat> to get the same angle. So it was the technical part of it as well, but also it was getting um, as we called it the cameras to be able to dance with Austin. And that was about preparation and rehearsal. And we would rehearse with him on stage so that by the time we shot it, we were all in harmony. Similar to Mandy, we, you know, obviously the, the special exists. So we uh, poured over all the detail. Obviously, it's hard to find drawings of all these things. So we literally were scaling. We were looking at the size of people and trying to scale how big the actual Elvis sign was and, and all of those details. But then again, there, there are the elements that help to build the emotion in that scene, which are Steve Bender and Bones are at the top. They're, they're overlooking 
him, they can see him there from that control room. That wasn't necessarily the way that geography worked in reality, but it worked for those being able to see that in the background and having that Christmas set just sitting there, just sort of while everyone's gone home for the day, it's just sort of this little uh, detail there, which I think is quite beautiful, that it's still there and it's present and he's looking at he's looking over it and he's looking at them. So all of those things, we were, of course, being very true to the period with the, the control room um, and the studio itself for what you actually see in the 1968 special. So what, those performances that have been put on, on film and they're there forever, uh, we were very meticulous about that. We also needed to serve the story and the emotion in those scenes. We had to compress time. So Karen, or Kaza, as I sometimes call her, said it very well. We do use license. We do use devices. There's no, no question about that. And you'll start with seeing Elvis, Austin, Elvis, same person, starting to kind of mark out the song. That's Austin singing. By the time we get to the end, though, that very famous recording that Elvis actually did, laying on the ground, gut-wrenching, all of that, it turns into Elvis's real voice. So we have to try and get this kind of seamless progression going from this very intimate moment where they're rehearsing, building the song, where he comes the Colonel, there's a living extension, here it comes, and then yet Elvis comes on and triumphs, you know? And it's all in a short period of time. It's such an important song, and uh, what people might not know is that Austin sang it full heart every song, and that gave us the choice to go back and forth, in and out between Austin singing, which in this scene is him singing in the beginning and then transitioning into the Elvis original tracks. And Austin, I wish you could sing it today because I think the world needs it today as well. And you know, you're the current Elvis. Oh man. Austin, please give us some sense of what it was for you to inhabit these songs. Oh, it was extraordinary. I mean, I knew that I, I wanted to set out to sing everything as though it was what was going to be used in the film um, for a couple of reasons, one of which being that's that's how Elvis expressed his own emotion and and uh, and just the, the genius of him and his musicality. So I knew that that was such a key into his spirit. So I, I never wanted to be miming anything. And, and I also, even if there was a moment where where I thought, you know, this is such an iconic moment of Elvis's voice that they, they, Baz may decide to want to use his voice in this moment. I, uh, I wanted to know that I was singing it as, as full out as I, I could because um, it connected me spiritually to him. When you sing full out and, and you're, you're connecting to the same intonations and breath, you end up being taken on this ride emotionally and uh and and you're saying certain words that that connect to your heart and i i mean i feel very fortunate because in, in a way I, I got to go on this journey uh with every song that i sang as elvis that was i, I can't imagine anybody having a closer experience to what elvis got to experience in that moment then when you're there you, you're just you just in the spirit of, of the music and what that song means, then you end up feeling like you're able to merge with him in, in those choices, you know? And, and um, yes, yeah, so it was very special for me. Deep in my heart, there's a trembling question. Still, I am sure that the answer, answer is gonna come somehow.
Goosebumps. That particular performance was only on like 12 track or something like that. It was a very, very degraded performance. It's great. But Elliot so cleverly reconstructed the orchestrations and yet was able to pull the original vocal and also blend the Austin's. I mean, such a complicated layering. And in the mix, I mean, it was so intricate to do that. And even I can't work out which one's Austin and which one's Elvis. It's kind of amazing to see. Quick question for Jonathan. But Baz has talked about the compressing time. Um, the end of this scene, when he finishes I Can Dream, you get there's sort of a collage to give a sense of the impact of this moment. How to, just figuring out those sort of shorthands to be able to get all this story, just give us a, a quick sense of that. Well, Baz came up with a, an expression which he used, uh, we used to call poetic glue. Um, and I think we came up, I think it was the Great Gatsby Baz, is that correct? We came up with poetic glue. Mm, yeah, poetic glue. Uh, yeah, get down. It, and he, it's basically kind of shorthand for um, layering kind of extra information visually on top of the picture. Uh, so we see that collage of different uh, headlines uh, that appears towards the end of the song to uh, add extra information to, uh, to give to the audience without adding time. Well, I think in the end, our solution, which was just him on magazines, just gave you what you needed to know, that he was back, that it really affected culture. As we said, this is a pivot point into a next chapter. But we all know how this story ends. Everybody walks into the theater knowing how this story ends. What is this scene set in motion and set up that then, you know, rolls down to what the ending of the movie becomes and the ending of the story becomes? I um, mean, I, I think this is, this is one of the high points of Elvis's life and artistic, uh, artistic life for sure. But it, but it does set in motion some great times of of you know all the music that comes in the late 60s and, and early 70s that gives way to Vegas which those that those first couple of shows in Vegas god I wish I was there I mean you were there. You were there. I, I feel like I was well, I wish I was in the audience uh you know getting to getting to watch I mean uh, fr from the 69 show or all the music that he was recording you know when he when he goes back to Memphis and um, you know, and, and into the seventies, but then, then he gets stuck in that gilded cage and, and, uh, and, and we know the ending, but, um, that's what sort of sets in motion that, that new chapter of his, of his musical life and get to create some of the greatest music I think ever made. And Baz, for you, what's the, you know, from this moment to that, you know, to, to the, to the ending moments, what, what, what's playing against each other? It was triumphs and he realizes that by believing in his own instincts and going back to the gospel it sets him free and as a consequence he goes back to his roots memphis and those american studio recordings chip smellman and all of that that's the great great elvis music i mean he's truly involved in our music and he even defies the colonel again about the publishing over suspicious minds he went back he did his own music he started to spread his wings. He was going to get on that plane and fly away. But that old colonel was a tricky fish. Don't we know it? Drama ensues. And tragedy, actually. Tragedy. Tragedy for sure. Well, thank you, Baz Lorman, Austin Butler, Mandy Walker, Karen Murphy, Michael Keller, and Jonathan Redman, all here representing Elvis. Uh, I'm Alan Light. Thank you all for watching. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you all.